beloved and friends, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of fighting for. The gospel is worthy of fighting for. You will fight for the things you value most. You will have conviction and you will lay down all manner of everything you have within the reach of your own strength for the things you value most. And the gospel, the gospel that reveals the Lord himself, Christ, is that which we as his people should value above all else that we have in this world. It is that which not only reveals to us, but takes us to him. It is that very thing through which we have hope and the only hope in the whole world. It is the greatest treasure and it is entrusted. The greatest treasure you could ever know, you could ever, ever, ever inquire of. The greatest treasure you could ever discover is right here in this Christ. And the gospel is entrusted, that has this Christ, is entrusted to the church. You, me, not to buildings and not to schools and not to professors and not to other people, but to us. It's entrusted to us. We are responsible. We are stewards of the glorious treasure. And that treasure is best kept. In fact, I would dare say it is only kept when it is kept aflame in the heart. If I were to say that I gave my love to my wife and I asked her to keep it while I'm away, how would she keep that love? By a mere intellectual ascent? Or would she keep that love by a flame? Affection, conviction, value. Well, this is the gospel. And this is what's entrusted to you. The church to keep it aflame in her heart. This is what we have before us. The gospel is given to the church to love Christ and to make much of him in this world. I want us to see then out of Jude how the church is commissioned to take this gospel and to steward it well, come what may, pain and martyrdom, whatever it costs, this is more valuable. So what Jude does is he begins, let me just give you an overview because we're just kind of dropping into a book we're not in the context of. So let me just give you an overview. We're coming into this. This is the half-brother of Jesus. He's the brother of James, he says. And we know that James had another brother. By the way, his name was Judas. That's what Jude is in the Greek. It's Judas. So here is Judas, the brother of James, both of which are the half-brother of Jesus. Now, what's striking about that is all we know of Jude is this letter. What we know is that he was, he was a brother of Christ and came to faith late in life. And when he came to faith, oh, it was radical because now he talks of Jesus as his master and his Lord. He speaks of him in such high venerating tones that he can't even bring himself to acknowledge any relationship whatsoever with him. He says, yeah, I'm a, I'm a brother of James. You know that, but Jesus is altogether an other category. Well, all that to say, this is the letter he writes, and what does he write? He writes to the church, and what does he want to write about? Well, he's trying to write to the church about the salvation, the gospel we have in Christ. He wants to write to the church about that. But what we find, and we're going to get to it now, is this, that he couldn't. That something, as it were, fell upon him with great constraint, and he was gripped by Something deeper than a joyful communion of delighting in the blessings we have. Rather, it was a, an arresting conviction. Oh, that this is so precious. It is so valuable. 
He's calling every one of your hearts to say, steward it well. Steward it well. This is the context, and I want us to see he moves in, in, in a progressive thought. And then I want to lay the, the history of the Reformation alongside to help us connect and see application there. The movement of thought is simple. He begins with the thought of salvation. It's the end of the line. It's the fruit of it, the benefit. It's, it's, it's the consequence, the effect. But that's where he starts. He starts with, with where we are, those of us in Christ. He starts with us having this grand benefit of salvation. He then moves from salvation to stewardship. And he begins to use terms and tones that speak of this, the value of this, we are responsible to take care of. And then the third movement of thought, which we will end on, is he moves to the substance of it all. In other words, if you've listened carefully, you'll notice we're backing into the matter. We started at the, the fruit of it. And then we begin to examine the strength of the tree, the trunk. And then finally he takes us to the roots and says, it was from here. And what's the point? Here's the parallel to the Reformation. We enjoy the fruits today, beloved. But are we mindful of our responsibility to tend and steward, to keep and maintain what gives us that fruit? And how then do we do that? How do we maintain the gospel? Well, backing in to the real matter, the substance is finally what we have been given in sacred scripture. So, let's begin that journey. The movements that Jude takes us through from salvation to stewardship to substance. And then we'll see how that connects again to the church in history. Well, let's look, number one, at salvation. We find first here, this is, this is really uh, concerned with the idea of what benefits we have been given. That's the idea. We, he wants to address us and speak to us in ways that we can understand salvation. Look at the first word that he uses. Look at it with me. What does he say in verse 3? Why don't you say it? Beloved. Beloved. This is a, a powerful word and it, and it speaks of, 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 a, of, of salvation. You are beloved. This isn't merely a kind uh, and, and personal uh, mortal greeting. This is, this is something that reflects uh, truly a love that comes from God. Look at verse 1. What does he say there? He says, you are beloved in God. What does he say in verse 2? May love be multiplied to you. Here's the grand fruit of it all. Of all that has happened on the cross. Of all that has been written on the pages of scripture. Of all that has been given to the church therein. Here's the fruit of it. You are loved. You are forever loved. In fact, notice what this love means. This isn't some passing emotional experience. This is something that you, you will take eternity to begin to appreciate. It's going to be an ever-increasing mountain you will never, ever fully comprehend. The love of God is beyond what you can take in. Listen to how he, what he means by this love. Look at verse 1 again. What does he say right after he says, you are beloved in God? He says, you are kept. So he attaches the idea of grace to this love. It is a gift. It is a gift. Being loved by God, it's a love that keeps you, not a love that you, you have to keep. Though you do keep it, the whole matter doesn't depend on you. It depends on his love for you. You are kept. And not only that, look at verse, uh, all the way drop down to verse 20. What does he say there? But you, beloved, 
Again, he addresses them, beloved. And not only that, but look again at what he says even later in verse, uh, in verse 24. And now to him who is able to what? Keep you. He opens and closes his letter with these tones of love that keep you. His thought is salvation. His thought is the fruit of all that we, the church, have. And it's an unusual way to start, especially in these, these letters. These, meaning the last letters of the New Testament. You notice they all have a shared theme, a shared theme of striving in the midst of opposition, constantly, constantly prone to wander or fall away. But this sense of, of striving, that's what Hebrews does, right? That's what James does. That's what First and Second Peter does. That's what First and Second and Third John does. That's what Jude does. All of them call us to contend, to strive. Well, it's odd in these letters to start with love, and Jude does because his thought is consumed with with uh, with salvation. So yes, Jude loves them, but that's not the point here. It's not a particular love of Jude that he's speaking of. He's speaking in pastoral warmth, representing God to the people. He's speaking to the church as God would speak to them. Isn't that what a shepherd should do? Speak to them as Christ would speak to them. You are loved. You are eternally loved. You are loved and kept in this love. So now we, we open the doors. Tell me then, what, what do you want, Lord? Knowing that you love me like this, wh- what, what do you want? Let's look at this love. In, in that's, each of these is fascinating. I've got three major movements that I see Jude taking us in of thought. Salvation, stewardship, and the substance. But, but in each of those, he has three little steps. So the first step here was we are beloved. Second step is that we are cared for. In our salvation, we are beloved of God. Number one. Number two, we are cared for. And you can see that here when he says, I was very eager to write to you. Why? Well, because this is the pastoral tone. There's an eagerness, a a strength of desire, a a, a burden for your well-being. That's what salvation does. It it creates uh, the community and Christ himself appoints shepherds to, to love you. So it starts with the love of God, and then it moves to the love of those who care for your soul. He says, although, although, well, what in the world is although telling us? Well, it's clearly telling us he had another letter in mind. He had something else he wanted to write. In fact, the repeat of to write to you, to write to you, is clear. He's, he's struggling. He, he wanted to write something that he didn't. Although... There was a change of plans. There was a sudden interruption. Uh, Something gripped him. And this is in contrast, you see, this idea that uh, I wanted to write to you this, but this, this thing I wanted to write stands in contrast to what he says in the Greek, I had necessity. So this I would like to write, but this I must write. We'll get to that in a moment. Here it speaks of the care, the care for you, the care for the people of God. He says, I was very eager. And it's a fascinating thing because he's using in the Greek language, it's very colorful. He's using uh, a word that means I was making. I was uh, going about doing this thing. I was producing it. And he uses it in a tense that I was doing it. I was in the process of it. I'm, I, was, I was making every effort. It's a good translation. That's the idea. I was making every effort. I, with all diligence, he adds the little adjective. I was making it with all diligence, with eagerness. I wanted strongly to do this. And I think Calvin touches it when he says that he, there was so much concern for them on his heart that he was anxious to write. And Thomas Manton, he says... He, He speaks as if nothing else mattered to him but their spiritual welfare and how he could help their faith. This is salvation. This is you are beloved of God and you are cared for by his 
people, and in particular, his shepherds. And then thirdly, the third little step on this first part, not only beloved of God, not only cared for, but also, here's the point, common salvation. This speaks of our salvation. It's a, it's, it's a shared salvation. Meaning, it's yours and it's mine. And we koinonia, we, we join in together with it. We have it in common. It is yours and mine equally if you are in Christ. No hierarchy of spiritual closeness to God. But there's this beautiful picture of a common salvation, about our common salvation. Now, you, you think about what he just described, and I just wanted to run a, a thought to you carefully. Here's Jude writing a letter, and he says, I wanted to write to you about something else, but, you know, uh, or about this common salvation. And then he's going to write something else. But when he says I, this common salvation, he speaks of it as something we already have, because how else is it in common? We don't have things we don't have in common. That's not, you don't speak like that. You don't say, yeah, we, we have in common something we don't have. What? No, no. You only have in common the things you do have. So what does it say of the gospel? What does it say of salvation? It says you're beloved of God. It says you're cared for. But it also says that this salvation is in your possession. You have it already. It's yours. It's in you. It's mine. It's in me. We share it together. It is Common. So some people would like to say, well, wait a second. Doesn't the gospel say, you know, it's future? Well, actually, actually, salvation from God's perspective, he communicates it to his people in past tense because of grace. In the present tense, I think because of both grace and responsibility. And in the future tense, because of responsibility. So each tense, you see, they, it moves from total grace. In other words, past tense discussion is always to remind you that it's done. It's as though already completed and full. Like you're already in heaven, seated in heavenly places. Past tense. Present tense. It's happening right now. So don't stop. But it's happening right now, so rejoice. And future tense, press on, dear brother, for it has not yet been seen. Let me give you the examples. Past tense, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us. And the tense, done. I just love it. Just love it. Done. It's a picture. The tense tells me it's a picture. It's, it's a picture. Here's my whole life and eternity there on the edge. And the picture, I'm there. It's done. He saved me. Total, complete, over. The fighting is done. I'm saved. That's amazing. That was not talked about for a thousand years. But that's the Bible. That's the Biblical gospel, Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Notice the emphasis always when it's in the past tense. Grace, 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 grace. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Sounds like a lot of work of God and none of ours. Well, the next thing, Romans 8, 24, he says, for in this hope we were saved. Hmm. In Ephesians 2, 5, he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And there he's talking in a tense that says, it was done in the past and it has an everlasting consequence. Or Ephesians 2.8, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Or if I, I could keep going, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, who saved us, past tense, all past tense. How about the present tense? 
Many times we're told in the New Testament and there's this beautiful merging and mixing and wonderful, delightful sense of duty and responsibility and and strength and, and a love like a throbbing heart ready to run and do whatever, whatever his love calls. Oh, this is the picture where grace comes in and mingles the heart and stirs it to joy and delight with responsibility. And says, but you have, a, you have a life to live. You have sin to kill. You have to turn from temptations. You have to continue under the trial. This is the present tense. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of God, or the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. In the process. To us who are being saved. It is the power of God. What's the emphasis there? Rejoice in it and strive. Well, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 2. And by which you are being saved. The gospel by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Unless you believed in vain. That's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15, 2. Being saved unless you let go. How about 2 Corinthians 2.15? We, uh, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And then, of course, of course, our own text, right, is in the present. We have right now. We possess it right now. We have a common salvation. How about the future? Don't forget there is a future tense use also. All of the same, exact same Salvation, and not for different people. These are all for the same people. Listen to Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have not been justified by his blood, much more, we have now been justified by it, much more shall we be saved. <laughs> because we're justified, our hope, because the whole context of Romans 5 there is on hope, our hope future, our hope of something we don't yet see, our hope is based upon that reality of what Christ has done and therefore we have a salvation we do not yet fully see. In other words, when you think of this future salvation, yes, you strive, but you also are awakened to understand, dear saint, understand this. The salvation that God promises you in Christ is beyond anything you can imagine or think. It is so much greater than you can presently know. So when you say, I'm saved, be reminded. Not yet. You are in total. You are being, but you're not yet. And the reason you're not yet saved and you think about that is, I can't even fathom how wonderful it's going to be. How utterly, utterly different I will be. I will love the Lord even more, but I will love him purely. Oh, this is the beauty of the future tense. And uh, again, 1 Corinthians 3.15, he says, if, anyone, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. That's a very powerful text to remind us that those who are saved by Christ, even if they stumble, even if their works get burned up, in other words, they were worthless, they will be saved. Future tense. 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me. Here's the great apostle Paul, and he's writing in his last letter, and he is in, he's, he's facing death just, just a few clicks of the clock. He's old, he's tired, he's wounded, and he's struggling physically, and he writes, he will rescue me, he will rescue me. Future tense, he will save me. One more, 1 Peter 1, 5, uh, who by God, you, you, the who is you, who by God's power are being guarded. Just imagine what that means. You don't see the kinds of forces and powers 
in the spiritual realm that God appoints to guard you. Who are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. A salvation ready, anxious, waiting on tiptoe, can't wait for you to see it to be revealed at the last time, future. Are you with me, beloved and friends? Do you see and understand this wonderful gospel, past, present, and future? If you're in Christ, it is, start here, a done deal. But now you live. So live treasuring it. And don't despair when you don't see all the results you might expect. But press on. Because they are ready to be revealed. Well, I think that's a lot wrapped up in that little thought. But, you know, it's there. It's a common salvation. Something we already have. But it's more than we sometimes give thought to. I love what Spurgeon said about this. He said, it is, it is not a matter of the future alone. A blessing to be sought for on a dying bed. And reached in heaven finally. But. It is a blessing for the world and the present time. The true faith, salvation that we share, we live in our marriages. We live in our parenting. We live in the workplace. We live in the marketplace. We live in schools and neighborhoods. And we live when trials come and hell and, and health fails it's a salvation we have now and share so it be, should be conceived as a present possession not some distant attainment and that made me think not some distant attainment because whenever whenever the substance which is the last point right whenever the substance whenever the truth of the gospel Whenever we drift from it, if it's darkened or lost, you will always wander into fields of works, thinking that salvation is something that you attain, something that you finally reach and acquire in the future. But this is a reminder, oh no, no, it is a present reality because it is of grace. It is because you are loved by God. That's why. So in, in, in really incumbent in this idea, pregnant here is the idea, this common salvation is this idea that, that it, is, it has been received. You have it, I have it. I can taste it, I can hold it, I can touch it. There's something there where it's handled and it's enjoyed. It's not something that, oh, I hope someday. No, I have today. Will, will you go home with a smile? And thank God that he has so loved you that he gave his only begotten son so that you would not have to perish, but that you would have everlasting life that can be lived starting today. This is the idea. It should be something that, that defines and marks us and that we hold. That's how you're going to steward it. If it's not that, you're not going to steward it. If it's just propositions and truth statements, you're going to yawn and want to go off and watch something. But if this gets inside your soul and moves you as a present possession of tremendous value, well, now, now we're talking a different thing. I'll have to come back to this. I fear I don't have enough time right now. And I won't have time at the end anyway. So I'll just mention it and then I'll move on. And it's the idea that some have faulted the Reformation for division in the church. And they point to all the denominations as an evidence. Maybe you do. And right here, my heart aches. Oh, I wish I had more time. I could just bring you in and say, oh, please. 
any so-called unity apart from Christ is a false unity. And therefore, the division that the Reformation did bring was only exposing the division that existed, but unseen. Why all the denominations? One word, pride. There is but one faith. There is but one common salvation. And everyone who acknowledge their, acknowledges their sin and that they are in desperate need of a Savior, that the guilt they feel when they do what is morally wrong, that it's real. And it's a gift to remind them they are accountable before a holy God. Everyone who knows this, who's impacted by this, and seeks for the only solution, the only way that a sinner can be made right with God, namely a substitute, Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, perfect without sin, stands in the place of the sinner to take the full punishment of their sin and to grant them the full admittance and entitlement to the Father as he did. Well, that substitution, that great exchange is received only by faith. These are the things of true unity. Everyone who has that, Christ and Christ alone, as the means, as the basis of your salvation, the means to receive it is faith alone, and it is a work of grace alone. These are the things of true, common salvation. So I dare say, despite all that you think or have heard about denominations, there is but one faith and there is but one church. Unfortunately, pride mars us all in the outward display. May it not be among us. You know, it's kind of irritating when I'm... So what, what denomination are you? And uh, I have to think carefully about that. I don't want to offend. But the bottom line, bottom line, is I'm not, I'm not all about denominations. I'm all about Christ. And this is not a Christ of my own thinking or imagination without historic creeds. It's not a new invention. It is truly guided, first and foremost, by the power of the Holy Spirit, illuminating His Word with the assistance of the legacy of the faithful throughout the ages. So, with that in mind, I thought of that when I thought of common salvation. Well, here are the keys. Uh, we have benefits. We have build benefits here and now, right now, we are loved. We have the salvation. And because of that, we might have all different levels of understanding. But there is not different truths. There is not different levels of salvation. There's not different levels of gospel. No, there is one gospel. There is one faith. There is one church. There is one salvation. And it is shared by all, regardless of what your level is of understanding, so long as that understanding is, let go of yourself and every effort you have to make yourself right with God and cling entirely and exclusively to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is truly God, truly man, lived a perfect life, died on the cross in the place of sinners, rose from the dead on the third day, manifest himself as Lord of all creation, has authority and power uh, of heaven and earth to command every knee to bow, and someday it will happen. Everyone who recognizes that and trusts in this Lord with humble faith, oh, we are one. With that in mind, Jude's purpose in saying this really is to contrast, not denominations, but to contrast condemnation. Because verse 4, he introduces false teachers who are condemned. So the contrast is those who are in Christ and those who are in themselves. That's salvation. That's his first movement of thought. The second movement of thought is stewardship. Let's look at this. Number two is stewardship. And he moves right on to say, uh, to speak of priorities really. If, if, the, if the first one, the idea of salvation, was what benefits do we have, the second one, stewardship, is what responsibilities do we have? 
And, and, and so this, this idea, this responsibility, because of how great is what he wants to address. And the first thing I think we should see is priorities. What do I mean? Well, when he uses that word, I found it necessary. What he's doing is he's stressing the idea that I wanted to write something else. But unlike that something else, the, the, the joy and the wonder, the, the shared communion of salvation, the, the delight we could talk about in that, oh, instead of that, unlike that, this one takes priority. In other words, as family, we can enjoy what's in store for us, and we have time for that. But right now, there's something else that takes priority. And when we are able to enjoy it, oh, we do, and we do, and we should to the full. And that will vary in time and place and person. But the, the point here is, in Jude's circumstance and in that day, in the church, there was a priority. The priority was first, we need to steward what we have. That's the priority. We need to steward. It's a sense of, I, I wanted this. This is the choice I wanted to make, but I couldn't make that choice. I had no other choice. I had, I was compelled. I was constrained. I had to write something else to you. B, so that's A, priorities. B would be responsibilities. So B, number two, B would be, here's the responsibility, to write appealing to you. <laughs> but the word appealing is weak translation. It's a weak one. Parakaleo is the idea. Come alongside and to call it out. It is the word for exhort. It's the word to urge, to beseech, to beg. Here's the point. Clearly he wrote this to motivate the church. He's saying, look, we have something so great. I had a priority constraint upon me. And now here's the second thing again. Your responsibility. Your responsibility, church. Oh, there's a deep responsibility. I want to... I want to exhort you. You know, in fact, the word encourage comes from here as well, often in English. But you know what that word means? Well, in is a Latin prefix, and it means, although it's spelt with an E, it actually means in, in, like into. And what's the next part? Courage. So what does encourage mean? It means to come and to speak into the person courage. To encourage them, literally to inflame them with courage, Unto this responsibility. That's the idea here. It is to motivate. And beloved and friends, I want you to mark it. It's, notice it's for all Christians. It's not, it's not for some. It's not for the elite. It's not for the graduates. It's not for those who wear cloth. No, no, it's for all Christians. He says, he says I, 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 to you, all of you, all of you, I, the church, everyone in Christ. And this just blows me away because that didn't exist for a thousand years. And here's, a, here's the idea. I love what um, Spurgeon gave an illustration. Maybe, we, maybe it's largely lost on our day in America. But there was a day in America where this could be appreciated. If, you're, if your homeland was threatened by attack, you know what happens? Everyone in the homeland, they bond together. And they use whatever means they have. I don't care if it's a pitchfork or a broom. They do whatever they have to protect what they have together. Well, that's the idea. He's saying, church, do you not see? Let me speak into you courage. You need to take arms. You need to take serious this necessity, this priority for you and me. To guard what we have. Because we are being attacked. Well. It's not just of the things out there. That threaten. It's not just that we need to do this. Because uh, you know. There's something out there threatening the church. You know if you look at church history. Never was it. An outside force. That caused. The major failures of the church. Never. Every major failure of the church in 2,000 years has been from within. And here's the point. 
it starts with you. It's easy to sort of get worked up and, you know, all pumped up. We kind of rally and we, we you know, we get, we get all pumped up about false teachers out there and other things going on out there and all these other people doing their things. And, and then we sort of get a sense of community in our rally. And it, all the meanwhile, we have overlooked our own soul. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever known that? It's important that we understand that there are real dangers out there that we need to work together on. But it starts right here. It starts where no one knows, where no one sees, and where no one hears. It starts in the quiet of your own personal thoughts. That's where you need to steward first. So when he starts to say this about, you know, uh, we, we, need to, we, we need to be exhorted to responsibility. Well, here, here's the point. It's not only what we must protect for future generations. It's not like we have to just keep the homeland of the church. It's, it's we, what we most desperately need for our everyday soul, for our own life. And so therefore, let me just mark this. The whole business here has more to do with treasuring Christ than fighting. But the third, C, number two, C, is to write appealing to you. Oh, that was number two. To contend. So here's two C, exertion. First one, priorities. Second one, uh, responsibilities. Now, exertion. This stewardship is a matter of priority. It's a matter of responsibility. And it's a matter of exertion. Exert yourself. Contend. It actually comes from the Greek word agonize. And it's the only time this word is used because he, here, Jude wants to add another word to it. And that other word he adds to it amplifies it. So he literally means super agonize. It's a word that was common in military and athletic use. And it meant that you would, you would intentionally sacrifice everything for the goal. And as you did, you would be particularly attentive to remove every obstacle so that you would attain the goal. That's the idea. You would agonize. It involves pain. It's serious. It's sacrificial. It's intense. It's exertion. And the tense he uses in the Greek language is one that says right now and ongoing, you have to, you have to be doing this. This is, this is what I'm breathing courage into you for. Now, strain. It's pretty intense language. It's a serious struggle and it requires self-denial. The implication is it will not be easy to steward the gospel. It will not be easy, and it will at times be agonizing. And what a statement on the Reformation. Not easy, but agonizing. The situation in Jude is that immorality has crept in, and I find that striking. Why? What's the solution to immorality? Laws? Stronger disciplinary action? How about guard the gospel? When people start living immoral lives and claiming Christ, you have a massive door of corruption in the church. Immorality is the main thing he's going to address in verse 4 and and he goes on in verse 7 and 8 and 10 and 13 and 16 and 18 and 12, or 19 and 23 and on and on. He also addresses uh, rebellion and materialism and deception and, div and divisiveness and, and so forth. All of it is crowned in verse 4 where they deny Jesus as master and Lord. Denying obedience to Christ as Lord. Anyone who does that denies Salvation, they deny the grace that we have. They deny that, that he is theirs and that they love him. 
Well, here is the, here's the main point of stewardship. It is a priority. It is our responsibility. And thirdly, again, it requires exertion, a strong word. Let's finish this out with the substance. Number three, major point, substance. Here, let's start with this before we break it down. Uh, first of all, if the first one was, you know, what benefits we have, the second one was uh, what responsibility for those benefits do we have, and now is this, what is it that we steward? What is it? We've backed ourselves into it now. Now we begin to see, okay, what is this thing? What is the root of it that we need to be so careful with, that we need to, we need to guard as though with our lives, with all exertion. What is it? What is it? Is it morality? Is it, is it our behavior? What is it? He tells us right here. Oh, to contend for the faith. And mark the the. If you mark in your Bibles, you can just underline the. The faith. Not your faith, not a faith, not a personal subjective faith, not my trusting and believing, but rather the faith, the body of Christian doctrine, the body of Christian truth, the, the, the contents of the gospel, the faith, the faith. Here's the idea. Oh, all the emphasis goes there. He hasn't even introduced what we're contending against. He hasn't even told us about the enemies yet. Not at all. Not a word. Everything's just been love. You're saved. Oh, but we have a priority. And let me tell you, you've got to fight for the gospel. What's the point? You don't even need to know the enemy. He can be here, there, something else in a new age. But every single time, the main issue is the gospel. Is the church guarding the gospel? Is the church upholding the gospel? Is she fighting for the gospel? Is she dying for the gospel? Is that what she delights in? Is that what she's preaching? Is that what she's living? Is that what she's using to, to deal with marriage conflicts? Parenting issues? Loss of loved ones? Conflict in the job? Is that what she's doing when a crisis hits? Is she looking and holding and reveling and praising and guarding the gospel. This is, this is the point, the faith. This is what it's all about. In fact, I love it. Oh, I'm out of time, I can see. How does this happen? Oh, that only started at the Reformation too. But here, here's the point. <laughs> I'm serious, but here's the thing. I, in the Greek, I would like to translate it this way. So I'm going to give you a very difficult, uh, very unfavorably English translation to this last clause. That you agonize, super agonize for the, and now there's this big hyphenated conglomerate, for the, once for all delivered to the saints, faith. Literally, that's how the Greek reads. That you agonize, super agonize for this one thing. And what is it? It's well, it's the once for all delivered to the saints, faith. It's not just the faith as in English nicely reads. No, it's faith is at the end of the sentence. And what qualifies the faith is the faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints. Let's break that down. And, uh, and, and oh, I pray that the Lord would use this to stir your hearts. Um, let's break that down. Here's the point. An A, 3A, is that it's a past reality. This is simple. I, it's simple. He says that was. That was. It was delivered. You can see, oh, there it is. That was. That was delivered. So it, it, you can add delivered there because that's what the, the verbal connection is. So it was delivered. It's, 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 it's done. It's in the past. It's a past reality. Whatever it is regarding the substance of it, which is the gospel, it's a past thing. Listen, it's news. Good news. Good news. You never work. You don't, you don't hear news and try to accomplish news. You don't accomplish news. Who accomplishes news? Nobody. You hear news. News is about a reality outside of you that has already happened. It was. And that reality, this past tense, this past reality is the news that Jesus of Nazareth is God in human flesh. And he died on a cross. It happened. He screamed, Tetelestai. It is finished. And all the demands of justice have been satisfied for his own. And in that moment, oh, in that moment, it's done. Past. It was. It's news now, I proclaim. 
You can be saved by this thing that happened. You can. It's news. It's past. It's a past reality that we guard. Oh, guard the gospel as a past reality. Number two, not only is it a past reality, it's a final reality. It's a final reality, once for all. You know what it means? The first one, past, just says it was signed and it was sealed. The second one, and it is settled. It is signed, sealed, and settled. This, this reality is, it says that the gospel doesn't grow. The gospel doesn't adapt. The gospel doesn't change over time. It doesn't evolve. It doesn't, it doesn't change. The gospel is a once-for-all reality completed. It's completed. What? what does that mean? It means there's no additions. There's no revisions. There's no omissions. You don't touch it. It's given to the church, and the church doesn't touch it. She just loves it and proclaims it and shares it with everyone she can. And this once for all, I dare say, it is a, you know, it's not up. The point is the gospel, it's not up for debate or discussion. It's not up to your canons of church law. It's not up to your practices. It's not up to councils and creeds. The gospel is God's and it is final. Over. You don't change it. It's a once for all. It's a final reality as a final reality because it, Well, here's the point. It's attached to the once for all sacrifice. If I had time, I don't mean to say that, but I, uh, it's become a habit. Here's the point. If I did have time, I would take you through Hebrews and show you all these places where once for all, he died once for all. He died his blood once for all. Sacrifice once for all. That's the idea. The gospel is attached to that. And therefore, once for all. Lastly, we close with this. It's not only only, um, first this idea of, of a past reality, a final reality, but it is a possessed reality. And it's right here, delivered to the saints. A possessed reality, delivered to the saints. This means we have it. It's been entrusted. As we started earlier, we talked about having this common salvation. So we end on the same note. Let me just close this when he says, to the saints, stressing where I started. The church is the steward. You are. Put away the American mentality that someone else will take care of it. Let the professionals do it. No, 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 no. The gospel is yours to steward. You must contend for the faith, starting in your heart. And with all of its beauty and humility with one another. Oh, here's the point. When Paul writes now to training pastors, this is what he says. All of these are in his pastoral letters. Listen to how he describes the church in relation to the gospel. 1 Timothy 3, 5, 15. If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is, notice the behavior is the fruit, because now he backs up, which is, and the reason why that behavior is called for, because huh, the church of the living God is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Not seminaries, not publishers, not podcasts but the church. He writes in chapter six, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Pastorally, that's what a shepherd should do in the church, calling the church to the same. Second Timothy 1.14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Beloved and friends, I seriously had intended to go and give like a massive illustration through the Reformation, but I'm out of time. And let me just humbly acknowledge this. We love and we celebrate and we rejoice and we teach and we steward the Reformation. Not to make much of the Reformation, but to make much of this, this Christ. And I wanted you to see Countless lives willingly gave their blood so that you and I today could be right with God, could gather and sing with one voice in our own language, could rejoice with tears over the salvation we share, could serve one another in love, 
could have shepherds that care for you, that speak to you in your own language, that you could have the very faith, the body of truth in your own language. This, beloved and friends, is because God was pleased to raise up men and women who laid their lives down contending for the faith. May we honor and steward it well, starting in our own lives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. What a privilege it is to speak to your church. What a, what a blessing it is to see her. I love her. I thank you for her. I even now lift her to you and ask your protection over her. I pray, protect her from the evil one who would seek and delight to destroy her. I pray you protect her from the world and all of its nonsense and deception and, and lies and vying voice to rob her away from you. I pray that you protect her from her own self and her fleshly moments and her weakness and her self-centeredness and all that she is so prone to. Oh God, protect your bride. I pray that she would be awakened even through the truth and power of your word to be reminded today to contend for the faith once for all delivered to her. You are worthy. Help us to continue our worship remembering all of this comes back because you are worthy. In Christ we pray. Amen.